Hey, it's Joel Duff here. Welcome back to my channel. I know it's been a little while since I made a video and this wasn't the video I expected to make next. I got a couple on the queue, but I happened to see this one. I thought, love to talk about this for a few minutes. Nice example of misconceptions about genetics and about like popular stories that you hear, like elephants that are becoming tuskless and, and uh, hunters are causing them to become tuskless. Well, there is some truth to that, but there's also a bunch of misconceptions. And uh, young earth creationists who... Um, comment on it, fall into some of those misconceptions. So I'm going to use a Young Earth Creationist article to show um, some more of the details of what's going on with tuskless elephants. So we've got tuskless elephants aren't exactly what some creationists think they are. Got that coming up. Okay, let's kick it off with the article that inspired this particular video. And that comes from Creation uh, Magazine, which is from Creation Ministries International, which is their, and this is their sort of uh, uh, publication they send out to all their subscribers. And then within the next six months to a year following that, they begin to publish some of those articles on their website. And this one happened to pop up yesterday. I took a quick look at it and I said, oh yeah, I want to talk about that. I did a brief a little bit of research to make sure that I remembered the story right. So we're going to do a tiny bit of genetics that one little Punnett square, right, in order to demonstrate a point here and to teach us something about tusklessness, all right, and which is the tuskless allele um, versus, so it's a variant of a gene. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's get started with how do they present this story? How do the, how does this creation article to the Young Earth Creationist audience pre present it? Okay, here's this wonderful, uh, massive um, 1800s elephant and we have this little prologue that's basically saying what happened to all the giant tusked elephants you know we hear about from history right from a bygone era all right bygone is an apt description or very nearly so according to dr jones from the born free wildlife charity okay so now here we have our first statement that we're gonna gonna dig into here super tuskers are very rare these days i agree there aren't as many elephants that have massive trunks anymore precisely because their big tusks make them prime targets for trophy hunters now, that's a hypothesis, but I'm not going to quibble with that hypothesis. Uh, I think it's, it's pretty self-evident that trophy hunters are going after the biggest trophies, which would be the biggest uh, tusks, and therefore are taking out the largest elephants with the largest tusks, right? Typically males, but they're also taking out lots of elephants, whatever tusks they have. All right, so there is going to be a pressure, a selective pressure. We call that artificial selection, though, when we typically think of it as humans specifically acting on a single trait versus the whole organism, which nature is generally, you know, sculpting the whole organism, right? Uh, the environment overall is sculpting an organism. In our case, we're sculpting the organism by selecting a single attribute of that particular animal. So it's very, very strong selection. And so, yes, that particular selective pressure could result in a pressure uh, and an influence on the elephants such that if they were to lose their tusks, they possibly could be protected from poaching if the poachers only desire tusks, right? That seems kind of obvious. That's how natural selection works. And this would be like a really extreme example of that, pushing elephants to become tuskless. But there's going to be, there's a bit of a confusion here in this quote, and then that's going to cause confusion in what the young earth creationist is going to, how they're going to reflect upon it. Because these animals are all too often taken out, right, killed, before they have reached the reproductive prime, super tusker genes are being bred out of the elephant populations, and we could very well be seeing the last of them. Okay, that sounds kind of like if you didn't know anything about the genetics in this situation um, and didn't know that much about natural selection and the complexity of tooth uh, production, that was, this might sound like a very reasonable statement. Um, but where the Young Earth Creation is going to take it is, is in the wrong direction because they've been misled by this particular quote. All right, here you get the impression that uh, super tuskers aren't around as much. Well, that means that elephants with shorter tusks are around because the largest tusks are being taken out. But sure, that's, there's potentially a pressure to remove the super tusked elephants. But I want to point out that the super tusked elephants are the oldest ones. Males have the largest tusks, uh, typically. So there's a growth rate difference between females and males. And if you look at males with the largest tusks, you won't be surprised to find out those are males that are the oldest. They've been around the longest. And those are the males that uh, have achieved the greatest breeding rights, right? Males mature at maybe nine to 10 years old, but they have very little chance of having any offspring, right? They're not gonna win any battles for mates. 
And so therefore they're not going to mate probably for the first 10 years that they're sexually active. Uh, and that's the time when they have little short tusks, right? And they don't have the body size to be able to like throw around their, throw around their weight, right? And then as they get older and they become more experienced, right? They begin to challenge the, the, the older males and potentially win some battles and procure reproductive rights with some of the females. Well, that's the first chance they have to pass their, their genes on to the next generation. And so if you have the largest tusks being involved in winning some of those battles, then the animals with the very largest tusks then are the ones that get to secure the females and pass their genes next generation. And you might be saying to yourself, well, okay, that makes sense. Now, now the ones with the largest tusks, whatever genes they have for making those huge tusks, they get past the next generation. And therefore the next generation could have large tusks. And if you continue to take out the large tusk animals, then shorter tusk animals are the ones that are going to be the winners and therefore pass on their genes next generation. But do you see the problem here? The problem here is that uh, theoretically, all the elephants could have the same allele, same variance for tusk length, right? They could all have the same genetics in a population, all those males, for making long tusks. It's just that they didn't get old enough to make the long tusks. So if you get very, very old and you have the biggest tusk, well, then you're at the greatest risk of being taken out by a, hunt, hunt, uh, a trophy hunter. And therefore, you, you might not pass your genes to the next generation. Uh, and so if all those are removed and now younger elephants are able to secure reproductive rights, they get to pass their genes to the next generation. But if those genes are for long tusks, you haven't accomplished anything in terms of shortening tusks or making tusks smaller. In other words, that is uh, natural selection is not happening. Because natural selection requires variation, and it requires variation that results in different fitness. Uh, and you could say uh, if there's differences in tusk length, uh, significant differences in tusk length. So let's say two males are 20 years old, and one has huge tusks, another one has somewhat smaller tusks, and that's a genetic difference. Then if you take out the one that has the larger tusks and the other one gets to reproduce, well, yes, you do get to pass your alleles for the smaller tusks, whatever developmental genes, whatever variants you have that cause them to develop smaller tusks, but they're still making tusks. And what we're going to be talking about is, and what most people want to talk about and hear about is tuskless elephants, the act of removing tusks altogether. But that's not what we're talking about here. And that's not what the emphasis is. Uh, in this quote, well, I think this author might be a little confused about what's being referred to. Selection against long tusks, super tuskers, making super tuskers have shorter and shorter and shorter tusks. Does he think that shorter tusks just get so short at some point they just disappear and then they become tuskless? I kind of think that's what this author thinks is happening, is that we're selecting for shorter and shorter tusks until they just disappear. But that, in fact, is not what's happening as we're going to see because tusklessness is a specific trait. Um, that's already in the population, but I get ahead of myself. All right, so super tuskers are being bred out of elephant populations. Okay, again, we have to assume that super tuskers are somehow genetically different, but I'm not sure that, that we, we can prove that. I absolutely agree that trophy hunters take out the largest tusked elephants, but you'd have to show that the largest tusked elephants are genetically different than other elephants that are younger and have smaller tusks just because they're younger. You'd have to look at, you'd have to have a study, and this would be really hard to do. You'd have to have a whole bunch of 50-year-old elephants. I guess maybe it's not that hard. You could find a bunch of 50-year-old males and then look at the variation among them and their tusk size. And if there is truly a wide breadth of, you know, a foot or two length difference in their tusk lengths, and you can see that trophy hunters are, are more often picking the slightly larger tusks, well, then you have a case for the next generation having slightly shorter tusks because there's a genetic component to it. Uh, the variations there that you're selecting upon and bringing to the next generation. But I digress. We get too much into that. Let's, let's get back to the main point here. But I, I have to set the scene for what we got coming up. Indeed, once the genes for large tusks are lost from the population, it seems they're gone forever. Hmm. What, what does this author think the genes for large tusks are? Tusklessness uh, is, is, a, is a form of mutation uh, that causes a problem in the development of that particular tooth and results in no tooth forming. That would be tusklessness. Now, they still actually have that gene. As you're going to see in a minute, they have not lost that gene. No elephants have lost that gene. They all have that gene. 
and they can't lose that gene. And I'm, I'll, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold off in a minute and, and explain that in, a, in just a second. Um, okay, uh, but let's read through here because I want to get to this before I get to the genetics of this, because he's not gonna go over the genetics, and that's the problem. Doesn't doesn't acknowledge the genetic situation going on here. Trophy hunters are having similar impacts on moose antler size, the horns of big uh, big horn sheep, and so forth. Yeah, I actually talk about those in class. I have a figure from one of our uh, from the textbook that shows the the size of of big horn sheep, uh, the horns. You know those curled up horns on the side of the head. Uh, they have gotten smaller over time, and that's true. And, and this is the important part. Even on big horn sheep of the same age, they're now smaller. That tells you it was genetic, right? The largest ones, the ones that had the genes for making the largest horns have been removed from the population and those variations for making those largest horns have been removed and you increase the frequency of alleles, variants of those genes that create smaller horns. And so that is very clear trend, right? And that that's happens with fish, with all kinds of animals where humans are involved in selecting specifically, usually for the largest size of something we diminish the size very quickly through that process. But now remember, this is referring to like, this is the idea that, well, maybe tusks that are really long are getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter because of selection, but that is not what's happening with tuskless elephants, right? That's, that's not the series of events that occurs to create, to create a tuskless elephant. And that's where this particular person didn't do any research and doesn't know what's actually going on here. Um, the selective culling of herd whoops, the selective culling of herd members with trophy worthy tusks, antlers, and horns is essentially an artificially imposed select, uh, version of natural selection. I agree. The resultant populations are small sized uh, head armory in elephants, even trending toward complete tusklessness. Oh, there it is again, right? Trending toward complete tusklessness. He really thinks that longer tusks are getting shorter and then they get a little shorter and then they get a little shorter and they get a little shorter and then all of a sudden boom they blip out of existence and it's all right if you thought that too because i would understand hearing most of the popular level stories about tuskless elephants this is probably the perception you may have about how elephants have become tuskless is through some series of of uh small scale changes resulting in uh, an overall trend towards smaller um tusks all right, now we get to the thing. This is right in line with the Bible's creation fall historical account. It in no way fits with the evolutionary narrative that pond scum became pachyderms, no matter how much time is involved. With the idea that simple is becoming complex. They're saying, look, you have tusks, these wonderful characteristics, and they're huge, right? The largest, the largest is the best character, apparently, in all, in all situations. And, and the tusk is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. smaller, smaller. And therefore it's losing information and it's becoming less of an animal than it was before. And that's the opposite of evolution because of course, in the younger creationist mind, evolution is always progressing to, I don't know, always making larger organisms, always making more complex organisms and so forth. Um, and that's a whole long misconception discussion too. That's because neither artificial nor natural selection can ever generate any new genetic information. He seems to think, this author seems to think that, that, um, that having longer tusks has, is more information somehow. Like, like you got more genes, and then when you lose some genes, then you have shorter tusks. Because he says that right away. Once the genes for large tusks have been lost, like the whole gene lost from the population, then it seems like they're gone forever. Like they can never come back. Uh, but we're not actually going to talk about the loss of genes. That's not what's happening here. Right? We're talking about changes in the genes themselves. We're not talking about the loss of the genes. Um, that's because neither are, oh yeah, we're that. Selection, whether artificial or natural, can only operate on, right, cull out genetic information that already exists. Hmm, okay, I like this because it's gonna feed right into what I'm gonna say in just a couple minutes. Selection, whether artificial, can only operate on or cull out genetic information that already exists? Yes. Selection does not cause new mutations to happen. It's not like, oh, wait, it's not the elephants are like, oh, wait a second. Um, we've got these really long tusks and we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna be trophy hunted and therefore I'm gonna cause a mutation um, and, uh, and I'm gonna create a mutation because I see that, right? And then 
I'm going to have offspring that have shorter tusks and they'll be protected because of that. So I'm going to create a new mutation in order to protect myself from this new environmental situation of, of trophy hunting. Uh, no, the idea is the mutation already existed in the population. And then because the mutation was already there, when the natural selective event came in, that is trophy hunting, some individuals had no tusks already because it was already part of the genetics of the population. And those individuals had a better chance of surviving, better chance than they had before trophy hunting occurred. And therefore, they had a greater chance of surviving and a greater chance of having offspring than their friends and family. And as a result, they passed their particular mutation, their particular allele for tusklessness to the next generation, which then increased the numbers of elephants in future generations that have no tusks. Salient point here is the variation already existed in the population and therefore it was selected out of that population to form the future populations such that they would have higher frequencies of that particular characteristic. So he's right that you can't, selection doesn't make new variants, it only acts on variants. So the variants have to exist prior to the selective event. Um, okay, evolutionists evolutionist invoke genetic mistakes, mutations, to magically produce the genetic novelty whenever evolution requires it. Oh, now you just, <laughs> you said something good, and then you followed it up with something bad, right? You see what he's doing here? Doing this switch where he's saying, okay, well, genetic mutations magically produce the genetic novelty whenever evolution requires it. Oh, there's trophy hunting going on. So evolution requires, for these animals to exist, they better come up with some mutations, all right? And so they come up with the mutation they need. Hmm. Nope, that's not, what, that's not what I said happened. That isn't, that is not what happened in this particular case. But this is a common young earth creationist perception of how, what they think evolutionary biologists think is happening or say is happening. That, oh, the environment changed. Now the organisms look around, they're like, oh man, I better have some mutations. I better come up with some variants in order to adapt to this future generation. No, mutations are happening all the time. They create variation. The variation sits in the gene pool and that variant might not be important for thousands of generations. And then the environment changes and all of a sudden like that variant was like, look at that, I've got some benefit in this new environment. And they and that new variant, well, I'm not a new variant, that old variant that already existed in the population now becomes the focal point of selection, selecting it to become more common in the population. So maybe it was just genetically drifting before that. The stochastic events of being passed down by chance from one generation to another. And then all of a sudden it's like, I'm actually an important variant in a future population and I will be selected for in the future. The point is the mutations don't respond to the environment and say like, then we come up with the mutations. No, the mutations had to have already been there. The genetic variants already had to have been in that population to allow the population to change in response to the changing environment. In this case, trophy hunters coming along and those trophy hunters placing pressure on the population, such enormous pressure on a specific trait that is the tusks that a trait that already existed in the population, tusklessness, it already existed and it has existed for a long period of time, suddenly that trait is more important and that's why we're seeing it increase in its frequency. It has been around since before trophy hunting happened, although you could argue that trophy hunting has been around for a long period of time, but it's more uh, elevated in its importance uh, in the last couple centuries. Um, okay, where were we? We were talking about, oh, we were talking about this line. Evolutionists invoke genetic mistakes. Uh, yeah, I'm invoking mutations, but I'm not saying the organisms respond to the environment by at that moment making mutations that were that are going to be the ones that are, that are necessary for adapting to that environment. No, they're just saying like, here's all our genetic variation. Which of these variants uh, might actually protect us in this future, in, in this particular new environment of trophy hunting? But reality shows that such random accidents and hopeless, uh, are hopelessly inadequate for the task. Mm, not at all. In fact, this particular example is exactly a, a, the proof that this creationist is wrong. Okay, it's, it's going to be a really good example of how they're wrong. Indeed, in some elephants, at least, tusklessness has been attributed to a chance genetic mutation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree. 
tusklessness is probably the it is the result of a mutation at some point in the elephant population. Overall, mutations contribute to decline, not improvement. Now, I'm sorry, if tusklessness is a genetic variant and it's a mutation, which I think it is, and that tuskless variant allows some elephants to survive while its friends and family, which have tusks, die, and they survive and reproduce, um, then is that a loss of information? And is it a disadvantage? Is it a decline? It's a matter of perspective. From the elephant's perspective, this from the survival of the species perspective, the loss of tusks may actually be helpful. Right? In which case, that new variant is a beneficial variant. And it creates a new characteristic, tusklessness, which didn't exist before. Not having a tusk is a character versus having a tusk. Now, I think the creationists just want to say that like having a big, long tusk and, and actually the longest tusk possible is somehow the best. No, I, you know, having too long of a tusk is probably a disadvantage too. I mean, where do you say the tusk is the perfect length? But yeah, that's the question to ask to young earth creationists. What tusk length and what tusk size is the perfect length? And if they really start thinking about it, they're going to realize what's the perfect length is whatever the environmental conditions are such that that organism has the best chance to survive. And if that requires a tusk that's 10 and a half feet long because um, of the various environment that it lives in, the strength of the trees and the, how strong the sod is and how much it's going to, how strong it needs to be in order to uh, fight with a certain level of aggression in order to win the battle for mates. All right, that's going to determine this is the tusk length that is the best adapted in these particular in this particular environment. So longer one, worse. Shorter one, not so good. Just right, that's the just right characteristic. However, the environments change. The environments change because you have trophy hunters. Trophy hunters are part of the environment. Um, they're an extreme part of the environment, but they're part of the environment nonetheless. And what they're doing is they're adding a new stress to that environment. They're adding a new variable. And the new variable causes the elephants to have to readjust which combination of tusks, what tusk length is optimal in this new environment. And not having tusks is being chosen by that new environment, by the new environment. In which case, what is the best tusk length um, 10 years from now or 100 years from now? Well, I don't know exactly because I don't know what the exact environmental parameters will be in the future. But I, I do know that potentially not having tusks might be better for the elephant's overall survival. Now, you may, be, you may push back and you say like, I, I can think of lots of reasons why having shorter tusks is a problem, right? I understand not having any tusks at all gives you gives some elephants a disadvantage. They can't do some things they need to do to procure resources in their environment. So I would say it is a detrimental thing not to have tusks just in light of like food production and, and uh, protection. However, if there's another trait, if there's another environmental pressure that's stronger, right? And you know, you can have great tusks and all these other things, but if a hunter kills you and you never reproduce, well then you weren't the most fit for that environment, right? So it's forcing a change in those elephants. Um, overall, mutations contribute to decline, not improvement. This is true even if the decline, loss of information is advantageous, such as tusklessness. All right, at least he's admitting it's an advantage, but he's still calling it a loss of information. Now, I haven't shown you yet, but it's not a loss of information. It's not in the sense that I think this creationist think, is thinking. He's thinking because he said right up here, once the genes for large tusks are lost from the population. Now, he might be misusing the word gene, all right? Because in my mind, a gene is a particular location on a, on a chromosome where that has a program, right? Uh, an operating program and says, here's how to make this or it's responsible for doing something. And it could be like, here's how to make this tusk, but that same position could also be like, here's how not to make a tusk at that particular position. By the way, if you knocked out all the genes for making tusks, um, all the, the actual genes, and you just removed them, not only would elephants, not none of them have tusks, which half of them have tusks because all males have tusks. Um, and so that hasn't happened. Uh, but also, they just really wouldn't have any teeth at all. But they have other teeth, so this is this is um, a very specific thing that's happening here, and it's more than one gene. I'm only going to show you one gene, but it's actually a complex uh, polygenetic trait. Um, but that's too much genetics <laughs> for me and for and for this video. Okay, we're almost done here. 
but and then I'm going to go to the genetics. This is true even if the decline, the loss of information is advantageous, such as tusklessness in hunted elephant populations. The reason super tusk genes existed at all was not by evolution, but by creation. All right. So uh, they were created with the ability to make super long tusks. Again, there's a little conflation here. Super long tusks versus what, you know, a 10 and a half long tusk versus an 11 foot tusk. There's variation there potentially, genetic variation. So which is the original variation in the original elephant, right? Was 10 and a half feet better or you know, 11 feet better? Um, and so there's variation there. So, um, and the loss of some of those variants could change the, the, the tusk length, but still the genes are there. We're just talking about the variations in the genes. And so what I'm gonna show you now is tusklessness is a variant of a particular gene. It's a sex link gene. And that just means it's a gene that's on a sex chromosome. Uh, and therefore the condition of that particular, that, that that particular gene creates where it's expressed may be different in the sexes, right? And that's true for lots of sex link, what are called sex linked genes because they're genes linked to the sex determining uh, chromosome. All right, so let's, let's go look at that and then we'll come back here. All right, I've been building up to this idea of like, what is some of the genetics behind tusklessness and how is it different than tusks simply changing their size, their size gradually over time by tweaking the tusk making genes. So what it's been found is that, and I'll, I'll try to remember to put the paper uh, that describes this uh, in the description below. But what's been found is, let's say there's a, you have an X chromosome and another female has, a female has two X chromosomes, right? So in elephants, you have females, two X chromosomes, and the male is X, Y. Great, there's our chromosomes. Um, there's two different variants of a particular gene, right? So this is a gene involved in the directions for making that particular cuspid or making that particular cuspid grow out to extraordinary lengths to create the tusks of an elephant. And so we could call that uh, plus and minus. So you could have a situation where you have a female that is, let's just write it over here, X plus uh, X plus, right? That female could have inherited a, a plus version, a let's call that tusk version from one parent and a tusk version from the other parent. But you can also have females that are X plus X minus. And the minus is a variant of that gene. And if that variant of the gene exists, uh, that variant, um, stimulates the lack of producing a tusk. And it turns out it's a dominant trait, right? Dominant trait would be that particular, if, if a female has two, two copies of their gene and one of them is the tusk version, one's the tuskless version, the tuskless one is the winner. The tuskless one dominates over the, the tusk version of the gene. And so somehow prevents the tusk from being formed. So an X plus X minus is a tuskless female. Right, and then males can be X plus Y. That would be a tusk, a tusked male, and you can have X minus tuskless male. Except you cannot have a tuskless male. Turns out that that is a lethal uh, situation. All right. Uh, and that's not lethal because they just don't have tusks and they can't survive when they're 20 years old. It's lethal like very early on. Uh, in the, I believe in the embryonic stage, but now I just realized I can't, re I, I didn't actually look that up. So I'm not sure if that's embryonic or certain, certain, soon after birth, but it's not viable in the sense that a tuskless male, the, the, the male that has a X minus, uh, will never reproduce. So they cannot pass on the X chromosome to any offspring that way. So now let's go up. Let's see what happens in, when you have a cross, so you have a population and it has X plus X minus in it. And the male just doesn't even have the gene at all. Remember, we males are shortchanged because we have this smaller chromosome. And so we don't even have some copies of some genes that the X has on it. And so we only have one copy of our gene. So whatever version of that copy of the gene we have is our phenotype, is, uh, is what we look like. All right. That's our trait. And so females have, they could have a plus and a minus or a plus and a plus. Or they could be a minus minus. It turns out a minus minus, not good either. That's also a lethal situation. Um, and so you need one plus around in order to survive at all. And the minus then results in not producing that particular tooth. All right, not particularly that particular um, um, 
uh, tusk. All right, so we're going to look at one particular cross to, to, to show what happens here, and we're going to match that with some actual real-world data. Uh, so let's cross an X plus X minus with an X plus Y male. So this female is tuskless. All right. Uh, tuskless. And this male has tusks. Remember, I said before, maybe, maybe I didn't emphasize this before, but only females exhibit the characteristic of tusklessness. I mean, I just showed that the males would die in this case, but that means this whole question of poaching, of trophy hunting. Um, if you're trophy hunting males and selecting for males with the, against males with the very largest tusks, that doesn't really have anything to do with this particular genetic condition of tusklessness. That's why I'm saying these are disconnected ideas. The whole idea of, of bighorn sheep reducing the bighorn sheep, uh, the, the, their horn size, that's very much changing small changes in the genes that are reducing the size of the horns. Tusklessness is an absolute, like, you either have a tusk or you don't have a tusk. How long the tusk is, is determined by other genetic factors. It's a polygenetic trait. It's many, many things working together, and there may be many variants there and create slightly different sizes of tusks. Just like females have slender tusks and males tendly have thicker tusks. Females have shorter tusks, males generally have longer tusks. So you know there's some genetic differences in terms of hormones and all these other things that create different tusk size. We're talking about tusklessness, which is you have it, you don't have it. You make a tusk or you don't make a tusk. All right, so let's follow through this uh, particular uh, genetic cross. So, hey, and you know we got to do the old pun across thing that everyone learned in high school. And you said, like, you got one parent, the female here. So let's do female here. We got the male producing the sperm. So this male, when it makes sperm, right, it's going to make, and I'm going to drop the X and the Y. Uh, I'll, well, I'll, call, I'll drop the X and we'll just call it plus or minus. Uh, the male can donate a plus X chromosome, 50% of the time, right? He's going to take his two chromosomes, separate them into two different sperm, and and one of them's going to have the X, and the other one's going to have the Y, right? That's why there's 50-50 male, female, um, males produced in most generations. And then this is going to be the Y chromosome. So that's its two different possible sperm that it's making. And then the female over here is like, okay, I could uh, make a plus, an X plus, one, you know, I could make one egg that has an X plus in it, or I can make an egg that has an X minus in it. So I could take the tuskless version of the gene. It's the same gene at the same location on a chromosome, but one of them is the version for a variant, we call allele, for tusklessness, and the other one is for having tusks. So plus minus. And then the Punnett square tells you like, hey, when you mix these sperm and egg together, it, this is a, uh, by chance, right? You know, as far as we as as far as we can tell, what it looks like, right, is that the eggs are here, the sperm are here, and they mingle, and some sperm meet some egg, and they fuse and join, right, and so this plus could meet the X plus from the male sperm, and you could get a plus plus. That's going to be a tusked female, or the plus from the female, the X chromosome from the female could meet up with a with a sperm that has a Y chromosome, and then you're going to get a plus Y. So an X chromosome with a plus and a Y, that's going to be a tusked male. Or the female uh, X chromosome with the negative could meet up with the X chromosome from the male producing a minus plus, which is a tuskless female. Or the minus X chromosome from the female could join up with the Y chromosome from the male and produce a that. And we've already determined that this is a no-go, all right? So that's going to happen 25% of the time, right? Statistics tells you that happens 25% of the time. You're going to get that particular combination from a genetic cross. That results in only half the number of males being born, whereas the females are going to have two females for every one female born in a situation in this particular cross. So every time a female elephant that is tusless meets a tusked male, which is going to be always because all males have tusks, you're going to have the offspring, if they have four offspring, statistically it's going to be two females and one boy, and it's going to be one female with tusks, one female without tusks, and one male with tusks. Um, eventually, you're going to produce, in that case, if the female survives, this is this one right here, this individual grows up and it has a better chance of surviving, then that just means there's going to be more of these females in the population in the future. In the past, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 
this mutation probably already existed in the population, Tussle says, right? So that mutation occurred somewhere in history. We don't know where, but somewhere in history, there was a new mutation and that mutation created this tuskless state. And in most cases in the past, when there was no trophy hunting, what happened was there was a few individuals, very few individuals in the population that had the, there were females that had the tuskless state. And when they reproduced, they would produce more individuals that had tusks that didn't have tusks. But you know what? Having not having tusks was a disadvantage in the past. And so they had less of a chance of surviving. So that kept their numbers really, really low, right? But still persisted, right? And there are reports of tuskless females from a while back, right? So this is not a, like a new mutation that just happened, you know, just recently in response to selection. This is a mutation that existed in the population. And now we've turned around the selectional pressure. The selectional pressure was against females with that were tussless before, and therefore that kept that allele frequency very low because those elephants that didn't have tusks were not reproducing very often and therefore not keeping the numbers up. But now that these individuals that don't have tusks survive better, see, these individuals are the best surviving females. They're less likely to be poached. A hunter's gonna look, oh, no tusks there, I'm moving on to the next elephant. And if that female has tusks, then that female might die and so, and without reproducing. And so therefore, these individuals are going to increase in frequency in the population. Um, and they're never going to make a, a minus minus. Do you see that? You can never have a minus minus female. So all females are going to survive in the sense of they can be born. Whereas, because you can never have a minus male. And so you, since you never have a minus male, you can never get the minus and the minus together. So in this case, there's going to be more females. And what you're going to do is you're going to have a skewed uh, sexual uh, uh, sex ratio in the population. And that's exactly what's seen. So I think in the paper about Mozambique, the, this is the paper that most of this is based on. Um, they looked at um, severe hunting pressure, you know, over years. And what they measured was, is they found that there were many fewer males being born in the population than there were females. And the number of females that are tuskless has been increasing in that population over time. And so that shows the direct result of this selective pressure of trophy hunting skewing the sex ratio. And it also provides evidence that this is one of the genes that's really important. It's just one. There's another gene that's actually important for tussless just too. I don't want to get into that complexity. This is the simple one to show. Um, but this particular gene, um, this particular allele for tusslessness has been increasing in frequency. Whereas before it's just kept in check by natural selection, kept at low levels. Now natural selection or artificial selection is raising the frequency of that particular allele. But back to the article, the article makes it sound like, oh, the gene is lost as the genes are lost from the population, then it can never come back. These, this gene is not lost from the population. It's just a variant within the population that's changing its frequency over time and therefore changing the outcomes, changing the actual morphology of the organisms themselves but we haven't lost the ability to make teeth, right? The ability to make teeth is there. It's just that this particular tooth is not produced. All right, so what we have here is a case where this particular young earth creationist who wrote this article just in 2022, which was a year or two after the, the main paper that uh, came out with the genetics of the situation. And that particular paper was picked up uh, in all kinds of popular stories. Uh, but the popular stories generally don't go through the genetics of it. And they kind of spin this tale of, large sized um, uh, uh, large sized teeth right being reduced in size because of the pressure of, of trophy hunting um, and that led to the perception not just of these young earth creationists but possibly you and many other people that what's being selected for is just gradually shortening of the of the of the teeth now the caveat here is I think that that actually is going to happen too right? That there are variants of for size of teeth and that size could change as well, just like it does in bighorn sheep. However, that's going to, elephants are such long lived organisms. It's going to take many, many, many generations to actually see that effect. And so anyone that comes along and says like, oh, well, you know, the longest ones are lost. And so therefore they're getting shorter. Um, you know, come back in a thousand years and we can test that hypothesis because it's going to take that long for us to really see any significant changes uh, in the size of the tusks themselves. What we're seeing is just the strong selection on a particular variant that was like you either make a tusk or you don't make a tusk at all and therefore we can witness that particular change very clearly uh, in, a po in populations over a much shorter period of time because it's a much more dramatic effect but it's a very different effect than what most people are thinking in their minds is happening uh, so this younger creationist thinks that the information has been lost 
Now, I don't think there's any information lost here, right? The genome's the same size, the gene, they have all the same genes. It's a different variant of the population. And this variant wasn't made for this particular situation. It's a variant that was formed through just random mutations. And I know this author thinks that, well, how could you make a new characteristic that provided for better survival through randomness? Well, you're making lots of different mutations, some of which aren't helpful, some of which are neutral. But when you change this, when you change their situation, sometimes some of those mutations that already exist in the population now become important where they weren't important before. And it is the environment, right? The hunters in this case that have now made that particular variant more important than it was in the past. So it's changed the prospects for that particular portion of the genome. And so that portion of the genome is changing, all right? Uh, being selected for and shifted in terms of its um, frequencies of how often you make tuskless versus uh, tuskless uh, animals. All right, I, that's that's all I have. I just looked at this particular article and I thought uh, it's a good chance to talk about some like I think interesting genetics, uh, a little bit of uh, sex chromosomes, uh, sex linkage, which are very common uh, topics in say a genetics course. Uh, and how it's so easy to misconceive or misperceive the action of natural selection. Uh, and it really speaks to also how we define what the best is. What's the best feature for an organism? Um, and young earth creations tend to have in their mind some utopian view of what the best version of something is. But I think they rarely can ever define what the best version is and, and is why. Because once they start to do that, as I mentioned before, once you start to be a force to think about why a particular characteristic is the best, you'll find that the reason it's the best is because of the particular environment it's in and what it's doing to, to uh, accommodate that particular environment. And then we all recognize environments aren't all the same, right? The environment isn't the same today as it was thousands of years ago. Creationists think the environment was really different thousands of years ago. So whatever characteristic an elephant has now, massive tusks, wasn't necessarily the best characteristic even in their model at the beginning of creation. Um, so maybe long tusks were already an adaption to something else, a variant that was then selected for and changed over time since their creation in the creationist model. And now it's just being reduced again. Like how do creationists know that the tuskless version of this gene wasn't in the original creation, that God designed the original creation with both variants, right? Creationists want to say that they don't want to have mutations actually mean anything and be important for how organisms adapt. In this case, tusklessness is an important adaptation for these elephants in this current live in this current world. And so you can't you can hardly say that it's not an important variation. And so if that's base, if that's comes from a random mutation, then then you've you've lost the, the case that random mutations can't produce useful information, right? That helps benefit organisms and helps their survival in the present age. So the other alternative is to kick that mutation and say it's not a mutation, say it's part of the original state of creation. Uh, in fact, you could say maybe most elephants didn't have tusks in the original creation. You know, maybe they didn't need them, and then, but God gave them tusk ability all right, as part of their genetic programming. And then when the world changed because of sin, they needed their tusks because they're going to need to fight with each other and they're going to need to knock down trees and do other stuff to survive, which they didn't need before. And therefore, that gene became more common via natural selection over time. So maybe that gene, is, that frequency has just gone up and down over time and we just have the same variance. Um, I think actually that is what would be the better argument for young earth creationists if I could give some advice as to how to, how to interact with examples like this. Um, either way, I don't think it makes a lot of sense, but nonetheless, that would be the best way forward is to not uh, allow this to be an actual mutation. Um, but allowed to be a created mutation or created variant uh, in the original kind. Okay, that's enough of this particular topic. Hey, thanks for hanging out with me. We'll talk to you later. Oh, hit like, subscribe, and uh, a little bit of what's coming up. I got this week in creationism. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Todd Wood being taken to the woodshed uh, a little bit with the younger uh, evolution things. And, hmm, I don't know. I got some other interesting science stories that I want to cover too. So with that, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.